Okay, so in being mindful of everyone's time and uh, wanting to respect the fact that um, I know it's nighttime for some people and so therefore evening and whatnot, I, I don't want to keep people on too late. Um, I am going to start by introducing myself and my co-host Bianca. So welcome. Uh, I see someone from Montreal, wonderful, which is my hometown. Um, I am here in Montreal, like I just noted, and we are actually enjoying a nice sunny day. It's been a, a month of rain. So I'm Carolyn Samne. I am a co-founder of a boutique firm called The Pillars here in Montreal. We do work across the space of organizational effectiveness, organizational transformation. We work around uh, everything that has to do with culture, uh, strategic change, organizational change, and we've been working in the field for a number of years um, as the pillars, we've been a organization, a company for 10 years. So I have my colleague Bianca with me here, who I will let her introduce herself before we get going into our uh, topic for today. Hi everyone. So I'm Bianca. I've been working with uh, the pillars for more than a year and a half now. My background is in psychology. So if you ever want to discuss human behavior with me, you can DM me. And with that, we'll get into um, a preview of what we're gonna be discussing today. Awesome. Bianca, can I ask you to just uh, take notice of the waiting room while we get going? Yeah, I've been slowly admitting people. Okay, thank you very much. So welcome, like I said, to all from every corner of the world. So happy that you chose to spend some time with us this morning. Morning for me, um, like I say, afternoon, I'm sure evening for others. So. The topic today, leading transformation with human-centric practices to create organizational alignment. It's a topic that is uh, something that we're hugely passionate about, something that has been central to the work that we are doing, and wanted to share with you all uh, the work that we have been doing around this, this philosophy and this work. And we'll take you through this morning a little bit of the journey that we have gone through and how we got here, the framework that we're working with and why we feel that this framework has been helpful in helping organizations to create what we're calling human-centric and aligned change. So a little bit about our team. You just met Bianca. The team is a bit larger than this, but we have a vision where we see a future where people really are you know, as happy going to work on Monday as they are leaving on Friday. We see a world where there is a human approach to high performance, where profit is not the only thing that we seek, but that we seek people, profit, and purpose. So that being said, today's agenda, if you want to call it that, we're going to discuss um, how we believe human-centric and aligned transformation occurs, what are some of the key principles that we have uh, landed on to empower or to allow for this kind of transformation to happen. Some of the common mistakes that we've seen along the path and how that's rolled up into what we're calling our organizational transformation and alignment framework. So we will welcome questions and try to answer as many um, comments or, or questions you may have. If we don't manage to get through everybody by the top of the hour, um, welcome you to connect, whether through the Change Management Network, whether through LinkedIn or any other format that you want to reach out, a uh, conversation that we're very happy to continue to have uh, post this session today. So that being said, I am going to hand it over to Bianca to take us through the next little portion to set us off all right, so before we get into today's content, we wanted to ask you to answer two quick polls for us. So when you see the poll, you'll see two statements appear, and we would ask that you select the statement that you most agree with. Okay. Now, the polls are anonymous, so please be honest with us. There are no right or wrong answers. So, Carolyn, if you could bring up the first poll. So which of the following statements do you most agree with? People who are resistant to change will remain resistant to change, or people who are resistant to change may be open to change in the future. 
Mm -hmm. All right. So as we can see, I don't know if you can see Carolyn, but most people, 96% agree with the statement that people who are resistant to change may be open to change in the future. Interesting. Interesting. So now we'll go to the second poll. There we go. All right. So here's the second poll again, which of the following statements do you most agree with? Employees don't want to be burdened with decision-making during a change or employees want to participate in decision-making during a change. All right, I think we can close it now. All right, I'll share the results. All right, so again, we have a majority here, 95% who agree with the second statement, which is that employees want to participate in decision-making during a change. All right, so before I get into explaining what our polls were looking at, as change practitioners, we often see ourselves as external to the system, that is the organization with which we are working. Unless, of course, we're part of the organization's internal team, after all, we often tout the importance of an outside perspective as a reason for hiring us. In reality, once we enter an organization, we become an agent of change within the system. Our beliefs will necessarily affect how we interact with others in the system and what interventions we propose. This is why it's important to be aware of our beliefs as change practitioners so that we can better understand the impact that we will have on an organization and the people within it. What if, as change practitioners, we believed that a person's characteristics are fixed and cannot change over time? This is what's called a fixed mindset. If you have a fixed mindset, you may see change as a threat rather than an opportunity. You may worry that you'll be seen as incompetent. You may see errors as a sign of failure, and so you may avoid situations that might lead to failure. You may also attribute any behavior that you witness to internal or stable causes. So, for example, you might attribute resistance to change to a fixed trait within the person. As a result, you may believe that people who are resistant mm -hmm. to change will remain resistant mm -hmm. to change. Um, I think someone has to put themselves on mute, Carolyn. Thank you. What if instead we believe that a person's characteristics can change or develop over time? This is what's called a growth mindset. If you have a growth mindset, you're likely to see change as an opportunity to learn new things and to master challenges. You're likely to be proactive in addressing any setbacks that arise, and you're likely to attribute behavior to external or unstable causes. So instead of being due to a fixed trait, you might see resistance to change as resulting from the absence of a forum, say, in which employees can voice their opinions about the change. As a result, you may believe that people who are resistant to change may be open to change in the future, as it seems that most of you agreed with. In addition to fixed and growth mindsets, we also have beliefs about what motivates people. So imagine that our motivation exists along a continuum. At one end of the continuum is what we call controlled motivation. When our motivation is controlled, we feel forced or pressured into engaging in a behavior. We feel that our actions don't reflect who we truly are. At the other end of the continuum is autonomous motivation. When we're autonomously motivated, we feel that we're acting of our own free will and that we're expressing our true self. Interestingly, studies looking at organizational change have found that when we're autonomously motivated, we become less resistant to change and more accepting of change. So how might our beliefs about motivation affect how we manage change? Well, if you believe that employees don't want to be burdened with decision-making during a change, you may withhold decision-making ability from them. By doing so, employees might feel that their autonomy is being thwarted, which means that they might feel controlled, and then you find yourself in resistance to change territory. Conversely, if you believe that employees want to participate in decision-making during a change, you might grant them the ability to make decisions, which might make them feel that they have more autonomy and therefore they may be more accepting of the change. So how can we foster autonomous motivation when managing change? One way is to provide a clear and honest rationale for the change. Understanding why a change is occurring helps us to internalize the change. A second way is to offer control over decision-making where appropriate. One way of doing this might be to offer choice with regard to how the change is implemented. A third way is to acknowledge employees' feelings about the change. By being responsive to and supportive of employees' needs, you can encourage autonomous motivation. So I think that's a good segue into talking about human-centric transformation, don't you, Carolyn? 
Yes, thank you so much, Bianca. So one of the takeaways for myself around what propels transformation and change, and a lot of us are probably people who've been working in this space for a very long time, and there's been a lot that we've talked about and seen around, you know, how do we build capacity within people, within leaders, within systems to be able to truly go through a process of change. And the piece that for me was often missing was the idea of understanding ourselves, even as practitioners, and our own paradigms, our own motives, and our own assumptions about change, about power, about collaboration, about dynamics of human um, potential. So the polls really serve to help us get into our own thinking. And there's more we can explore about what it is that we bring to a mandate, whether that mandate is from an internal perspective or an external one, what does it mean to be a practitioner who truly espouses and believes in the growth mindset and things of that nature? So when we talk about what does it mean to be human centric, it's also something that we've been looking at over the years and having a lot of conversations with different people, different stakeholders, different organizations around, well, it's a big word, but what does it truly mean? And you'll see here on the slide that there's a culmination of a bit of a, a word cloud of the words that have been most identified as being resonant to being human centric. And they're words that, as you can see on the slide, um, relate a lot to trust, authenticity, empathy, and humility. So what does that mean and why does it matter? How do we bring these components into a process of change so that we do create autonomy for people to help them drive that internal um, motivator for change? So human-centric for us has a component, like I said, of authenticity, humility, and trust in it. And the other piece is when we talk about transformation, I think just to be clear, because the words change and transformation are often inter, interchanged and intersected. But we wanna be clear that when we talk about transformation, we're talking about things that are deep in shifting, mindset, behaviors, beliefs. So it's that the organization is sort of transforming from you know, the old analogy of the caterpillar to the butterfly. So we're talking about things that are very deep. We're not talking about just changing something that is you know, in the background and that has little impact to people. So how do we bring human-centric beliefs into a process of transformation? We also know we're living in a VUCA world. Um, some of you may have seen or heard this uh, terminology before. It's a term that's not new. It dates from many, many years ago, which was first uh, adopted, if you will, in, in the military, where they referred to the world as volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So when you talk about being in a world that is ever-changing, that is dealing with a lot more complexity and ambiguity, this is hitting organizations in ways that are also complex. It means the rate of change is speeding up. It means that we need to be agile. We need to respond quickly. The inability to operate in these conditions is making organizations become obsolete. We've seen many situations of large companies over the years that could not adapt. And we could argue, you know, why were they not able to adapt? And there's probably a lot of factors but what we want to talk about now is that these, I'm giving this as the backdrop. So we're living in a world where VUCA is our reality. We've seen it, especially in the past 14, 15 months with COVID and how it's impacted us as, as humans, as systems, as organizations. And if we really want to bring a human centric lens, it's what's going to be the linchpin, if you will, to helping organizations make rapid transformation because the more we're able to give people autonomy and the more we're able to give them agency, the quicker we're gonna be able to respond in a way that allows the organization to thrive, but also for people to thrive. So there's three key principles that we've been working from and that we feel are critical to helping organizations to get through 
rapid transformation while allowing not only the organization, like I said, to thrive, but for people to also be at their best selves. So three principles, leaders and practitioners must operate from ecosystem and not ecosystem. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, but in essence, what this means for us is that our practices have to be built on the fact that everything is an ecosystem. We must understand the nature of one button being pushed, everything drops throughout the organization. It also means that leaders have to let go of the fact that they are not omnipotent, they are not the end all be all. But also, I think we have to bring that lens and that thinking to ourselves as practitioners. What do we believe to be true about our roles? And a little bit like we did earlier with the polls, what mindsets do you hold and what beliefs do you hold? And how is that impacting how you serve the organization that you're working with? Organizations must be seen as systems and not as a set of parts. Historically, we know organizations are set up in very hierarchical and very siloed kind of models. This is not allowing for human-centric transformation because it limits engagement and it limits co-creation. People, you know, we're not saying anything new here about the fact that people must be at the core of the process and not merely the recipients of change. But the piece that we're adding about people is that, you know, often when we talk about change management, I've heard people say, well, it's people change management. Except what's been interesting is when we talk about people change management, it was still from a very one way perspective, meaning that we see people as the recipients of something. So therefore, we're going to massage the message to help them want to adopt it. We're talking about bringing people in in a much more concerted um, and, and co-created way. I just want to pause for a second um, and just ask if anyone has any comments so far, any questions, anything that you would like to contribute before I continue along the way. I'd love to hear. You can either unmute yourself or, or put it into chat. Okay, so if there's nothing, I'll, I'll carry on. So these key principles, as you will see as we continue to have this discussion, are principles that we've adopted in our framework, our human-centric transformation framework. So the other thing that we've adopted into our thinking comes from what we had seen as perpetual common mistakes in bringing transformation into organizations or helping, I should say, organizations to transform. We were seeing partial co-creation and involvement. What we mean by that is often organizations tell us, well, yes, we consult people. Yes, we've asked for their opinion. The problem is the consultation as it's identified tends to be very linear. And what I mean by that is we may send a survey. We may do a one-time ask of stakeholders or people who are involved but we don't do anything meaningful with the input that they've given us. So it's a bit of a, give me your opinion, but then I will take it back. We will give it to the people who are the masters or decision makers, and we will allow them to sense make what you're telling us. So that we're calling partial co-creation. People are asked for voice, but they're not actually asked for real implication. Second mistake we're seeing is decision-making held by only a few. So again, which is relative to what I was just talking about, we ask people for some input, but then we don't take a full cycle around giving them true agency. And true agency would involve not only voice, but also decision-making. Agency assumes people are whole and capable. When we have lack of agency and decision-making, we see that it creates disengagement and disempowerment in people, which in virtue of a change process will create what we often refer to as resistance. And then managing the change and not the transition. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the fact that change is an emotional process. It is very based in feelings. Change is often not a rational process. I think a lot of us are probably quite aware of that. There's tons of data also from neuroscience that shows us why the brain responds as it does. Yet we have been inherently, in our experience, poor at managing the piece of the transition, which is the whole emotional part, which is where the human centricity comes into play. Because reality is, if we truly believe 
that we can do change in a human centric way. That's acknowledging that change is not a rational process. It is mostly an emotional one. And therefore we have to equip leaders particularly within the process, but we also have to equip people to understand the process that they're going through and how to be empowered in the process rather than feel disempowered about the emotions that they are feeling relative to the change. Carolyn, we have two yes. questions in oh, the yes. chat actually. So okay, the, first, please, yes. the first is how do you get leaders to truly adapt to an ecosystem and not mm. promote silos? Mm -hmm. That's a big question. So, you know, um, I can tell you my perspective and then would love to hear other perspectives. So one of the things that obviously on the um, upfront piece of this conversation, and this is something that's been uh, a conversation I've been having with a lot of practitioners lately about how do we even set up the contract, you know, the social contract with the system, with the client. And I think that this is true regardless of whether you're an internal practitioner or an external one. When we come in and we have a conversation about the process and what it is that they see as our role in the process, what are the conversations we are having with people? How honest are we? about some of the concepts that we believe need to be present, like ecosystem versus ego system. How honest are we about the need for engagement at a deep and real level? Um, I think that sometimes, personally, I know I've been confronted with not using my voice in the proper way, not being very courageous in speaking to, call it the sponsor, uh, you know, the leadership team, the executives, about what I truly believe needs to be present. So what are those conditions for success? Now, of course, the other part of that is, you know, the conversations I've been having with uh, a lot of uh, people in the community is, well, what if the person doesn't want to hear about this way of operating? Now, of course, that is a look in the mirror kind of moment. And, and that's something that each of us has to answer for ourselves. What do you do when you don't feel aligned or that someone doesn't align with the way you believe something needs to happen? Um, and it doesn't mean that, you know, we just scrap <laughs> working with someone because they don't see exactly as we see. But in, what are those minimal conditions that you would need to put on the table and have a true conversation with the leaders to say that this is what we, we should be adopting as, as a process. Um, I'm actually amazed, I have been amazed that when I started to step into those conversations in a more honest and transparent way, the fear I had about resistance, I'm not saying that there wasn't resistance to it, that there wasn't pushback, but I had a lot more positive conversations than I did negative. So the fear that I had was a lot in my mind. And then when I stepped into the reality of the conversation, I saw that it didn't go as badly and I didn't get as much pushback as I thought I would. So I don't know if that answers the question, but for me, it's, are we truly having the conversations? Have we put it as a condition for our engagement? Because if not, the conversations remain the same. We allow, and I use that word loosely, people to continually perpetuate the same way of working. So at some point, if nothing changes, well, nothing changes, right? The definition of insanity. So I don't know if that answers, and I would love to hear um, more input on this if people have, I'd love to hear perspectives because it's, it's a very rich <laughs> question. Our second question was, what does full co-creation look like in a large organization when mm -hmm. the change has to be rapid? Right. So uh, we're going to go through a case in a minute. Um, and actually, but to that point, the case I'm going to talk to you about wasn't a huge organization, but we do have a story of a very large organization. Um, there are 8,000 across one business unit that was transforming within an organization of 30,000 people across the country. Um, they were going through a massive culture change. And 
the way we had to do it in that had to, we chose to do it in that context was the conversation started with the executive team around who are we becoming what is happening what is the actual change and then we just had to do it in different stages of conversation where the real work got tricky was as we hosted these facilitated dialogues across, because again, there was geography issues, people were you know, dispersed throughout the country. Um, at the time before COVID, it meant us you know, getting on planes and doing a lot of these conversations throughout the country. So the conversations had to happen. And then what happened was a committee that was put together that represented all the layers of the different leadership stratas, because again, A legacy organization, very mired in hierarchy, very mired in the traditional roles, uh, SVP, VPs, directors, senior managers, I mean, you name the layers, they had them. So first, the conversations, like I said, happened across all the layers. Then from there, we were grouping all this data, all that was coming out. And then the initial conversations were what is the change we actually want? Where are we headed? And then also what are the values that we are going to fun- fundamentally sit upon? Then we had to take a cross section of all these layers. These folks came together and had to work with all this data to sort of synthesize it. It is a large process, but it didn't take as long as what people might consider. It depends on how many people you have who can facilitate these conversations. They also um, had a big team internally. They have their own internal coaches. We worked alongside the internal coaches. We created a combined strategy of how we would accelerate this rapidly so that the facilitated dialogues were happening almost simultaneously in different geographies. Um, And then the data would come back together and then more groups were brought into the conversation. Look, it's not perfect in that sometimes it's going to be you're going to miss some people or you're going to miss some layers. And in large organizations, you may say we need representation, right? We can't get to everybody. But even then, who decides who represents? That's a tricky question also. Um, My experience has been It is not on us as facilitators or consultants to choose. We empower them to decide who are the people who should represent their whatever business unit, strata, level. So I don't know if that answers the question, but believe it or not, in an organization of 8,000, the conversations around who we're becoming and the values that we are espousing we were able to do that within a few months. Now, of course, it's iterative. It's not a one and done, right? Because we are in a VUCA world. As they were going through this process of transformation, of course, new information entered the system. But that's where we had, like I say, worked with the internal team of coaches that they had. And I know not every organization will have that luxury. But in this case, it was, it was a nice advantage that they have internal coaches. The internal coaches then had set up an internal process where information would keep looping back in so that the data could stay relevant. So you do have to get creative, but you know, you can use design thinking principles, human um, design principles. There's a lot of methodologies you can do, you can use to do rapid scale change in large systems. And I'd be happy to take that offline as well and have more conversations about that. Hope that answers. Um, again, I'd be happy to hear from anybody who would have some contributions because uh, I, I love these questions. <laughs> I, I love that. So I'm if I may, I apologize for the interruption. Uh, I, so you talked about core values with, within yeah. your example. And um, did the leadership team go through an exercise to create or draft or define new yeah. aspirational core values and then present yeah. them to the rank and files? Is that so they were sort of rolled out? Is that Yeah. So it wasn't exactly a rollout, but to your point, yes, they had to rethink values because the values that were anchoring the organization were ones Mm -hmm. that did not fit who they were becoming. Mm -hmm. So those conversations definitely were had. Um, And so because they were trying to 
take on new behaviors that were more mm-hmm. inclusive. They were really wanting to go after more of a servant leadership model where they led from behind instead of in front. So they wanted more voices in the values conversation. That one actually got a bit more sticky and more tricky yeah. um, because we wanted to go much deeper and, and um, you know, more breadth into the mm-hmm. organization. And yeah. so at one point, what happened was they came up with eight core values. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a lot, but that's my judgment. (laughs) So what happened was each team had to then, so we worked with each directorship to say, okay, how do these values actually translate for you? What do they mean? So we had to work with teams. Some of them decided eight was too many for them and they weren't resonant. So, and that's what the organization allowed that in a sense to say, you know what? These are the ones we believe serve, but we don't know for a fact that they serve everybody. So that's where they gave agency to the Mm -hmm. director level, particularly to say, you've got to make this work and fit for your team. So that's Mm -hmm. where the co-creation really happened at that level. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for the question. So... Given these um, common mistakes we've been seeing and the fact that we really want to move towards a world of more co-created human-centric transformation, which we believe has a lot more stickiness and a lot more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's, it's more fulfilling for people, right? Because transformation has to serve not only the organization, it really has to serve people. So from our our time and experience, we've brought all of this together and created what we call OTA, which is Organizational Transformation and Alignment Framework, which again, for us is about aligning some core areas in an organization to allow for rapid and transformation to happen, um, not just quickly, but in a human-centric way. So alignment, yes, and the how we have the alignment happen is is the beauty we believe of what we've um, been working with. So I'm gonna take you through a bit of a case to give you the context of how we use OTA. So the four pillars, and I mean, it's maybe looking like it's boxed and it's linear, but it's truly not. It, It is more of an organic process because again, Just because you've been through this piece doesn't mean you won't come back to this piece. So when we talk about strategy and culture, let me give you context and let me give you the case. So this is a company that's in the food industry and has a social mission. The company has been around for about seven years, so fairly young company, which has its pros and cons to it. It was founded by a young woman who had a vision to transform how the food industry that she's in particularly operates and wanted to ensure fair pay to the people who produce the goods along with traceability in the supply chain. They started small, one retail location. They now have three retail locations and had started even pre-COVID an online uh, subscription business. COVID hits, uh, shutdowns happen, and of course, the retail locations are are shut down. And so they start to ramp up the online business, and it just literally takes off. So one day to the next, their whole business model shifts from being 80% revenue from retail, 20% online revenue, to now all of a sudden, almost 100% because, you know, there was very little happening from retail. And now all of this is happening. So of course, it was good on one hand, because it allowed the organization to keep making money. But on the other hand, was creating a lot of chaos in that they weren't necessarily prepared to be a fulfillment and distribution operation. They had not as Prior to that, it was in their roadmap, but for about a year and a half, two years out. So as they were moving into this reality of the online business, well, not only did they have to shift their business model, people's roles had to change because, you know, even if you were a director of um, whatever marketing before, now all of a sudden you were packing up bags, you were fulfilling orders and becoming a distribution center. So This was causing a lot of, um, as we said, chaos, anxiety, and some of the questions that started to emerge for them is given the online business, what will our organizational structure need to look like moving forward? What are the skills and roles we're gonna need moving forward? Do our values shift as a result of this change in our business model? 
And essentially, who are we becoming? So the call came in to us from the director of people and culture and her ask to us, which is I'm looking for support and trying to rally the team in order to get everyone on board and be happy to be working with the new rules that they roles, sorry, that they'd been assigned. So although people were doing the work out of necessity, it was obvious to her that they were not happy and she was starting to see issues of engagement and motivation. So she asked us for coaching to help her navigate through this process and to prepare the organization for what would become the evolution of who they are and who they were becoming. So the process that we proposed and we've been working with her on is through our OTA. So prior to getting going, um, we did something called an organizational transformation alignment survey, which allows us to look at the four areas within the organization to see how alignment is, is showing. Um, this is an assessment that everyone in the company is invited to complete. And so the results of the assessment showed us that they really were showing a large misalignment and a large gap in the bucket of strategy and, and culture. So when we talk about strategy and culture, just to be clear, we're talking about vision, mission, the future, the goals in the culture. How is this represented? What are the values and beliefs and behaviors that are shared by the members of the organization? So we saw that there was a misalignment. So when we started to dig with them into this piece to understand what had been done in the past, what we learned was that the founder, along with her director team, were the ones who had designed, I use that word, uh, the vision and took the traditional method of wanting to just communicate it out. Now, what they were seeing as a result of that over time was that they was, there was a lack of momentum. People didn't feel the level of engagement to this vision, to the strategy, and they were starting to feel some drag. So they didn't feel like they were getting people's full-on commitment and engagement. And so acceleration wasn't going as quickly as they had wanted it to happen. So here now, how do we use the principles of co-creation, engagement, and ecosystem to lay the foundation for the change? So we propose to them that they adopt a bit of a different way to look at how they develop strategy and vision. So first we worked with the leadership team. We had some hosted conversations, wanting to understand their own con concerns and fears about the idea of bringing in more people into the conversation of creation of, of vision. Um, it was interesting because, of course, you can understand that in a founder-led organization, there is a, a, a desire to hang on to the essence of, of the company. So we had to explore where these fears were coming from, what was it that was holding back, you know, actual co-creation and engagement. So we had to also discuss, well, what parameters would they need to allow more people to come into the conversation. So what would co-creation look like for them? Because of course it has to work in the reality of an organization's uh, essence, right? So once they got clear on where they're at as a leadership team, what level of comfort, and then they had to explore their own fears about bringing people into a conversation of vision. So once that was aligned there, we were hosting team meetings with people to discuss where the organization needed to go. At the end of several discussions, the conclusion was that the vision did resonate with people, but where they were feeling they had no real engagement was that no one was asking for their voice onto the how the vision should be executed. So that being said, several groups were formed to look at the strategies that had to be put in place to make good on the vision. And I guess you can call them little tiger teams or little teams were put together for people who had interest in working on certain parts of, of the strategy. So for them, that's how co-creation evolved. And that's how engagement was put into play because they knew as they were moving into this new reality of who they were becoming, they really needed to have full engagement and full buy-in. Same conversation happened with values. 
The values were initially developed by the founder and her director team, and they took a push out kind of uh, method, which again, they had gotten the same kind of resistance. The director of people and culture, she was getting the, the bullets fired at her because people would come back and say, well, you know, this value doesn't resonate with me and so on. So they took the same process with values as they did with the vision. They had more meaningful conversations with people um, to understand what are people's core values, how does that translate into the organizational values? And they did end up having a shift in some of the organizational values. And so I'm not going to go into too much more detail here, just so that we don't lack time. But just to say that what happened here was they thought that they had a model of co-creation, but what they had in essence was partial co-creation, meaning that the directors would come together and then they would take the typical push out and tell people what we have decided. Um, and like most people, then they wonder what's going on, why are we not getting acceleration? So in the leadership um, bucket, sorry, let me go back one here. When we talk about leadership, we are referring to two things. How capable are organizations leaders to really take their organization through a process of change? And do they have a common vision of the transformation? Because I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this. You come into an organization, they say they want to change, and then you start talking around to different people in leadership roles, and then you're starting to hear different ideas of what the vision is. So that for us is a huge issue because, of course, it creates chaos within the organization. So in the past, the leadership team, even though small, four of them, not all voices even within the leadership team had equal weight or equal voice. So this was also causing some misalignment within their own team. In this misalignment, of course, it was causing issues within the rest of the organization, because as you can imagine, every director would go back into their teams. And when you're not aligned here, you can understand that obviously alignment can't happen in different areas of the organization. So the founder thought she was inclusive with her own team, her own leadership team. But then when we started to have, again, some honest conversations about some of her own fears about letting go, um, and we had some very honest discussions around what those fears and barriers were, some of the directors noted what it had been like for them to feel like they didn't have full agency or voice, even within the leadership team. And then we started to look at what does it mean to actually be a leader of change and what are some of those skills and, and capacities needed? So we worked, again, number one, we had to align the leadership team. Did they see the same things? Did they believe the same things? Because if not, that was having ripple effects through the organization. And then we started looking at what does it mean to be a leader in this organization? So they decided to have a collective conversation. And actually just yesterday, Bianca and another colleague of mine hosted a conversation with their full leadership team. So managers, team leads and whatnot to really align on what does it mean to be a leader in this organization and how does that align to where we're going in the future? So when we talk about organizational practices, when we go through a process of transformation, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, people say, okay, let's say we even got clear on the vision, we got clear on where we're going and how we're going. Yes, our leaders are aligned and have the capacity. And then all of a sudden, oops, we hit something in a process or a procedure that doesn't align with where we say we're going. A very traditional one that we see come up is a company says we're going to be more network centric. We're going to be more customer centric. We're going to be collaborative. We are going to want people to work in team based um, kind of ways. And yet when it comes time to do performance evals, or it comes time to do any kind of performance reviews, we're measuring people on individual performance. We are not measuring things that are team-based or collaborative. So therefore, what have we signaled to the organization? We've signaled that we're not really um, true about our vision of the future. So here, we really want the organization to understand what are the practices in place that may hinder or support your espoused desired future. Um, in the case of this client, for them, 
anything that had to do with people, talent, culture, always came back on the shoulders of the director of people and culture. Um, so whether it was developing talent or setting up policies, and she was starting to feel it was very heavy on her. And she was always having to push things on people rather than it being a pull. So in the context of who are we becoming, what is the structure of the organization we're going to need, they decided that to keep with the spirit of co-creation and giving people agency, that this was not going to be a discussion that was just going to be held, let's say, by the director of people and culture and potentially some other directors and then, you know, push it out again. So again, we created a process of co-creation with people in the organization to truly look at what is, and it might just be version one, what is the espoused organizational structure that we're going to need to put in place to move us towards this new business model that we're aspiring to as we continue to grow and evolve as a company? And again, you know, as we move through this, what was happening in the organization was a sense of renewed enthusiasm, which they were starting to see in the result of some people surveys that they were doing. Um, and even to the point where the feedback from the leadership team was the fear that they had about letting go never manifested. If anything, they started to see an acceleration that was almost too much for them. And business was growing in a way that was you know, a good thing, but at some level too, you have to be able to, to sustain that kind of growth. So in the organizational practices, again, it was no longer seen as just the role of the director of people and culture. And they started to audit within themselves, what are the practices we have today that maybe don't align with our vision of the future? So there's a whole bunch of things that they pulled out that they're going to need to work on. But the point is, it's not something that they have done by themselves. They did it with people. It is not the leadership team alone who will solve it. It will be co-created. Last bucket, when we talk about employees and, you know, this whole concept of people as a key principle, we talk about here, how do you truly create engaged processes and mechanisms where people get full engagement and feel committed to making this a success? So we can argue that employees should be at the heart of everything. But when we talk about aligning employees in the OTA model, what we're talking about is have you mindfully put into play structures, forums, or some kind of mechanism where employee voice and employee input is continually in the loop. So I'm gonna give you an example here of what was happening in this organization. They have what they would call transparency meets every quarter. And these transparency meets were designed to share information with people. You know, keep them in the loop about what's happening, where's the business going and so forth. So. Although it kept people in the know, it did not create deeper, meaningful engagement. It remained surface. It was more, again, of a push and not a bi-directional kind of conversation. And so what they were feeling in these transparency meets is that people were always poking holes at things, you know, well, the, the why and the how and the how come, and I don't think so. And they were not understanding why did people seem to you know, push back on these transparency meets. So we, again, we work with the leadership team to reflect upon the nature of these transparency meets and look to revamp for them to be more co-creative and engaged. So what this meant is that when they came to these transparency meets, it wasn't just about pushing information. It was more an invitation to help people come into a conversation in a meaningful way. So what they also did is they created forums between the transparency meets where the managers and directors now had a responsibility to provide a forum for people to bring voice so that the constant loop of information was always occurring. And the back and forth didn't just happen at the transparency meets. This showed employees that there was a true commitment to their voice, that there was a true commitment to them being engaged in a meaningful way beyond just attending a transparency meet and just kind of nodding yes to, you know, things that had foregone conclusions. 
So the result of working through this process, it was interesting. We were having a conversation about two weeks ago with the director of people and culture. And she said, you know, it didn't hit her up until maybe a few weeks back, how much the process of co-creation has accelerated their business and how much they thought that they were providing people with agency in the way they had been operating. But their model of agency had a very limited perspective to it. It didn't have true co-creation. So result, and this is from her words, not ours. They've started to create real alignment between all the areas needed within their ecosystem, and they've seen an acceleration in their business strategy with a growth in sales of 30%. The people who had initially been half-heartedly participating in the new business model were now 100% on board and committing to making it happen. The people who work in the retail outlets also found new connection and meaning within their work as seen in the employee surveys and were showing greater interest in being involved in committees and social events. Initially, they weren't sure about being able to open up any new retail locations as they were feeling completely exhausted and overwhelmed already with the transition to the new business model. Their renewed alignment, synergy and commitment basically has proven to be an accelerant and they have now decided to open two new retail locations and enter a new geographical location. So we wanted to bring this to you in, in the form of a story around how we work with this framework of organizational transformation and alignment. So, so two key things, one is to have alignment across these four elements we found to be critical Second thing is not just the alignment, but it's how you get to alignment. Because traditionally, when we've seen or heard about models of alignment, they've been, again, very narrow in limits of who is involved in creating this, which is then, in our estimate, not sustainable long term, doesn't create deep and meaningful transformation within an organization. So that's pretty much the story of, of OTA, um, how we came to the place of really recognizing that human centric has a certain flavor to it that requires deep and meaningful transformation and even how we work as practitioners and the areas of the organization that need to be thread together for real acceleration to happen. So we'd love to um, get your input, your comments, your feedback. I know we're getting close to the top of the, uh, the hour. So I'd love to hear um, questions, comments. Was it clear, not clear? Does it resonate? We have some questions in the chat. Okay. Um, I'll start with the one that refers to the case we just discussed. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how many months did it take for these shifts to A, be implemented, and mm -hmm. B, have identifiable impact? Mm, good question. Um, Bianca, when did we start working with them? Um, it was probably October, November. It was in the fall of 2020. Um, if, I don't know if you count, yeah, the motivation stuff that was done in uh, summer, June. Yes. But yeah, that was, motive, I would yeah. say, when we officially started. Yeah, we officially started the work with them. I think it was more the fall. It was October. Um, this discussion around results happened about a month ago, three, four weeks ago. So the process took about four or five months. Um, and some of the delay, if you want to call it that, is also um, just real life issues. You know, the founder had a baby. Um, there were some other things going on. So sometimes we had to delay bringing together people, but it was about, I'd say a four month process to date. Any other questions, Bianca? I'd like to add to the last comment, um, Sebastian Garcia here. He, the difference between uh, when the change is noticed and when the change really occurs, mm. uh, in my experience, and I've been working with mainly large organizations, there is uh, some sort of inertia uh, that we have to get through until yes. things, things uh, permeate to the top and we, we start noticing. But in my experience and from the feedbacks we get through the design 
uh, thinking process with employees uh, from day one, there already is a deep impact of having been in the process. Mm-hmm. And even before the beginning, through the consultation process with leadership, there is a shift in mindset that occurs that hasn't yet permeated through the organization that is not to be discounted. I fully agree with you, Sebastian. And I think it goes back to the adage, something I used to hear a lot in my graduate studies was the second you enter the system, you impact the system. So which is why we really want people to be mindful of, you know, their own being as a practitioner and the beliefs that we hold. Because if we believe in these co-created kind of methodologies, so to your point, Sebastian, the second we enter and we open a conversation around this, right there and then we shift the system, right, in in one form or another. So um, agreed. And, And you're right. I think there is a moment of inertia. Because don't forget, if we talk about the fact that there is a transition, an emotional transition, a lot of it is under the iceberg, as we say, right? It's not yet visible, but it doesn't mean the shift isn't being contemplated, even internally or emotionally for somebody. So I really love your point. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? There was a question for us. Oh, did someone want to speak just now? Yeah, this is Nidhi. I thought I'll just ask the question. So first of all, uh, Bianca and Carolyn, thank you very much. The session was very insightful. And uh, my question was only in the sense of that uh, during all your case studies or uh, experiences, what has been the biggest limiting belief that you've seen uh, for people to resist to change? That's number one. Second thing is also, uh, you know, mostly the middle layer is very much responsible to actually make the change happen. Mm-hmm. And what I've seen is uh, there are good instructions, good ideas coming from the leaders, good ideas coming from the employees, but managers who are actually to bridge them, they are generally not supportive for whatever reasons. So how do we uh, you know, involve them or uh, encourage them or motivate them more to be part of this whole change mm-hmm. management process? I'm going to start with your second question, because if any of you are on Clubhouse, we had a fascinating Clubhouse discussion last night on exactly the role of middle managers in a process of transformation and change. And again, if you truly believe in design thinking or human centric processes, um, by design, they will be brought in right up front in the co-creation of even the strategy, because you are right. Mostly they are the meat in the sandwich. They find something out maybe five minutes before anybody else finds it out. They're not given a period of integration, but worse than that, they were given no voice. So for me, the answer is how was the process designed in the first place? And if they were not put in as people who had true voice and agency in the process of even deciding, that is the result that we're seeing. So that's my very brief answer to that question. Um, So I think we have to rethink. And and I think your first question was, what are we seeing as the biggest barriers? Yeah, and limiting limiting belief. belief. Yeah. Um, I think to go back to the very first poll question, there's a lot of people who still operate from a fixed mindset. That to me is a huge limiting belief. Um, How many times have we heard when we come into an organization, people already peg, oh, that's negative Nelly. Oh, that's Fred the resistor. Oh, that's Mary the whatever. And we give these terrible kind of labels to people because we truly don't believe in a growth mindset and that is damaging. So I think we have to try to identify, first of all, what is the belief that maybe we are even unintentionally permeating um, and then to have conversations with people about what the beliefs they have about people's ability to change. So I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I think the fixed mindset, yeah, the fixed mindset for me is a big one. I would say for me, the most limiting belief that I've seen is the belief that our beliefs do not impact our emotions <laughs> and our behavior. So there's, there's, it's not important to be able to identify our beliefs. So I would say for, for me, it all comes back to that. Because when we're not aware of why we're acting the way we're acting, we can't really change the way we're acting. That's a really That's good okay. point. Yeah. Thank you. 
You're welcome. So I, oh, we have I, a few people asking, Carolyn, what club you were referring to on Clubhouse. Oh, okay. So Clubhouse, there's a, a room, uh, not a room, a club called the Change Management Club. Um, so if you are on Clubhouse, look for it. We have rooms twice a week, Wednesdays and Fridays. The Wednesdays is sort of change management reinvented and we talk about topical things, you know, how we are shifting our practice and whatnot. And then the Fridays is more networking and just open forums of conversation. Um, they happen at 7 p.m. Wednesdays and 7 p.m. Fridays. I'm also involved in the design thinking room, which happens actually Thursdays at 5 a lot of good conversations on Clubhouse. If you are not on Clubhouse and want an invitation, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to invite you. I know we're past our time and I, I wanna be respectful of people's time. So if anyone wants to stay and continue a conversation, I'm good with that. If you need to go, I, I appreciate and respect that as well. I know we had just a few kind of questions for you all. If you are able to stay, I'll hand it back to Bianca and maybe we can get a little bit of your input. Sure. First, we have people asking whether the slides will be available. Oh, yes, I can make them available. Again, I'm going to figure out how to put the recording and I could probably put the slides at the same time um, on the Change Management Network platform. So since we're in the process of creating this framework, you can say, and, and, and we would like to test it and, and see whether or not it affects meaningful change within organizations. We really appreciate feedback at this stage so that we can make this framework as great as it can possibly be. So with that in mind, we had a few questions for you to hear if any of you had thoughts around these issues. So our first question, was what would motivate you as a practitioner to work with models that are more human centric and what barriers might prevent you from working with these models? So if you have an opinion about that question, you can unmute yourself and let us know, or you can let us know in the chat. Well, I'll, I'll stick my neck out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I, I like the model. I think it's, and I, I made a comment to this effect. I, I, I find it, um, appropriate, relevant, useful, adaptable. I think, I mean, models by definition oversimplify reality, right? So you have to walk a fine line between oversimplifying the world and veering off to something that just becomes too complex. Um, the challenge I've always had in my strategic planning and alignment engagements is Oftentimes, whatever model you are applying, you, you, I mean, the, the client has to adapt that model. And it's like learning a new language, right? So you have to be very careful of, you know, the terminology and just the structure and the complexity of it. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. And I think you've done a very good job of simplifying things enough, but not too much. So that's always appealing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the ability to have the model, the framework be adapted and resonate with your clients so they can you know, you know, adopt the language of it, I think is, is probably critical. Um, right. I did want to ask a question about, um, that probably relates to strategy. So I'm a big fan of Michael Porter and sort of his view of strategy is, mm -hmm. as uh, well, a couple of sort of maxims. He says, you know, focus equals power. And I certainly believe in that. And I think the uh, Porter would tell you that oftentimes a successful strategy uh, requires some difficult trade-off types of decisions within the organization. And, you know, what it basically comes down to is you might be taking capital and financial and human resources from one area and putting it to another, right? And uh, a lot of times that's necessary. And those types of decisions, I mean, in my view, are more executive decisions. And I think to some extent, yeah, you need to involve uh, certainly middle management, but I, I, I'm not sure how much those types of decisions lend themselves to um, the, you know, co-creation. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, that's, that's a problem I grapple with. And a lot of times my strategic planning responsibilities, actually, we try to tie it into the actual budgeting process. So, we, you know, go from very, you know, pretty abstract to your resource allocation all the way through. And I think far too many strategic plans sort of stop at a, at a higher level and don't really yeah. get to those trade-off decisions. Yeah. 
So that that's a really good question. And I think it's one we grapple with all the time. Yeah. Is everything co-created? Is everything open up for, um, you know, input and comment? Mm-hmm. And look, I, I have my own personal beliefs about it. So, you know, of course, and my Y'all personal do. beliefs color, <laughs> color my, my work, right? Uh, but the reality yeah. is our models generally were written 50, 60, 70 years ago. Like most management models we're operating mm-hmm. from were in a time when the just the start of the industrialized revolution, um, we are in a knowledge economy, Right. We are working with people who, if you believe this, are whole, are capable, and probably mm-hmm. have a lot more knowledge and capacity than the titled leaders. So yeah. this is one belief I grapple with, right? Because mm-hmm. we're torn between staying with the status quo and what the typical models have told us about where decision and power sits mm-hmm. and who holds power, right? Yeah. So, um, Recently, too, talking to a colleague of ours who is she's also a strategy expert and she's been working more with ecosystems of strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, And her experience has been that the more you involve the ecosystem, the more powerful the strategy, because like you alluded to, Mm -hmm. when we step in and people ask us, can you help us work, you know, strategy? And when we ask them what happened to the last one, well, you know what the answer mostly is, right? It's on someone's hard drive somewhere. Um, never got operationalized. Why? Because, yeah. well, no one felt any commitment to it or engagement to it. And decisions were made in vacuums, right? Mm-hmm. Siloed, yeah. dispersed from reality. So, mm-hmm. you know, you try to take the system and the people where they are, but what I'm trying to do is push boundaries. So why are you only comfortable with yeah. this layer being involved, you know, because what are their limiting beliefs or what are the beliefs that they're yeah. hanging on to? And they're typically old beliefs, right? I, so I think that our, our work, this is my mission these days, is to change how we even uh, collude with systems, right? Yeah. Because we either have a mm-hmm. choice to make, we continue to perpetuate the belief that, you know, power only sits in certain parts of um, an organization, or we challenge them to try something different. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, at some level, you know, and you're right, it's in the prerogative of the organization to say, and that's what, you know, this conversation with the case I was just talking about, I asked them very honestly in one of the conversations, okay, what's the boundary? And let's be honest about it and let's express it to people. Because that at least for me, if you are honest and integral, then that is better than just telling people that's just what it is and too bad for you, right? Like you can even express the reason we're doing this is, for example, I'm not ready to let that go. You know, people are going to respect that more than just saying, well, too bad for you. It is what it is. I'm the dad and you've got to listen to me. (laughs) So that's a very personal opinion. Yeah. So that's what we're bringing yeah. into that strategy conversation. We're trying to push them beyond a little bit. So we don't want to mm-hmm. break people either, right? But if you were only used to this, can you at least go to that? Yeah. You know, dose it. We talk a lot about the one degree. What's the one degree shift you can make? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Pleasure. <laughs> Ariane, so, I see you raised your hand. I did. I did. Um, so one of the things that I, so I appreciate, I, I love the model. I think it's phenomenal. Um, but I would be remiss being in the space of anti-racism, diversity and inclusion and equity. Um, a lot of models are actually based on the premise of, of, of white supremacy and not, I don't mean people are white supremacist, but it's a Eurocentric thinking of, of what a model looks like and how it impacts the various communities that we're in. And so one of my questions is, have you thought about, or do you have ways that you guys have been interact in looking at an equity based lens or a race-based lens as you're doing these things because Caroline you talked about it right you talked about power and you Mm -hmm. talked about the layer of power and where that is Mm -hmm. but power looks very differently depending on how the impact and influence and who's in the room yeah and I have to tell you thank you Um, that's a huge one Um, I know personally um, also because as a result of this mandate that we were just referring to about um, the whole piece around diversity, equity, and we've even added, we've gone to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion with this client in particular too. Um, And I'm not pretending to be an expert. I know there's a lot of things I need to still unpack to your point about where does power show up, how, how it's different through different lenses. And um, 
And I, I'm going to tell you very honestly, I don't know if we've explored it enough. Um, I know it's something we're starting to really think about and look at and say, what don't we know and where might power be showing up? Like an example of that, to your point, recently it came to my attention that um, job descriptions and job postings are often written in a very um, limited perspective and it excludes people because of the language that's used in the posting. That opened my eyes, right? Because I thought, wow, you know, just by virtue of how we write things too, we exclude people. So I know for this client, for example, um, it was a huge conversation around where in our system do we maybe have points that are showing exclusion? Because, you know, the piece of inclusion, exclusion is a big conversation. So I, I, I... I don't really know that we've done that well, I'm gonna tell you very honestly, but it's something we definitely, I'm definitely aware of it. But for all I know, there's a lot of holes that could be poked in this, right? So I'm open to that though. Yeah, no, and I think it's fantastic. Like, as, as I said, I think when we just, when we talk about, when the question came about, you know, what is the barriers and it auto automatically, those are the, some of the barriers that I come into play. And when we talk about having models and how do we develop models and who develops models and who influences mod models um, is something that I've been, you know, just quite deliberate and mindful of. And so mm. thank you. And thank you for the honesty because most of us haven't really thought about it. Right. So, yeah, yeah, no, it's a work in progress. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank and you. of course, if you have any suggestions for us on this front, we'd love to hear them. Yeah, absolutely. So if people have a little bit more time, I, I would appreciate because Bianca has a few more questions and I'm taking some notes. <laughs> well, I'll just read out the other two questions together and if people can answer whichever one they please. So the next two questions we have are somewhat related. The first is whether you think alignment is necessary to the success of an organizational change effort. And do you agree with the four pillars proposed by our framework or do you envision a different model of organizational alignment? Maybe you see it as fewer pillars, more pillars. Sorry for the background noise earlier. I forgot to mute myself. Thanks Bianca for doing that. Regarding number oh, two. Oh, no problem. <laughs> uh, alignment is necessary to the success of the org change effort without a doubt, 100%. Yeah, if there's any question about that. I think the hard question is, well, how do you create the alignment, right? How do you, which kind of gets, I think, maybe to number three or, or a response I wrote to number three. Right. Well, I guess maybe an add-on question. Mm -hmm. Have you seen alignment occur on a regular basis in, in the work you're doing? And if so, what were those sort of spices that helped to, um, to bring that alignment well, um, again, I, I, I'm always trying to sort of be very pragmatic and with clients on identifying the levers. I mean, largely for, for leadership, it could be executive um, or middle upper management. I mean, what are the levers you can pull to sort of make, to create behavior change, right? I, I mean, generally, I think there are five sort of families or groups Um so you talk about the process that engages people in change and helps them prepare for change and accept change. And that, that's probably the sixth lever. I think more of an ongoing basis, but, um, and I, I tend to think like an engineer and I apologize for that. So, so um, culture undoubtedly is one of the levers that can be engaged, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do, right? be very time consuming, but it, it's certainly one that you have to look at uh, first, almost first and always and right away and understand where you are. If the culture fits, supports the change that you're trying to enact, or does it create blockers, right? The, the, the behaviors that embody the culture. So that's probably the first one. Um, yeah, the structure. So the, the roles, the, the formal roles, responsibilities, you know, how the work is organized, how the authority is organized, you know, where the expertise lies in the organization, all the things, all those roles, responsibilities, authorities, expertise, right? I, I call it REW. How 
how does the organization sort of formal structure configuration impact the behaviors, the things you're trying to accomplish? So that's probably another area where you looked. I mean, and I mean, your example of the food company was a good one. There was certainly a, a, a pretty big structural element to the change there, right? Going from a, a retail model to more of a sort of a, a wholesale or retail distribution model. That's a big change, right? And you guys address that. Um, systems, yeah, you know, I, I mean, systems, water systems. But I, I generally, in, in today's age, I think, you know, systems take a set of inputs and do something and create outputs, right? And generally, when I think of systems, I think of information systems. I am a recovering systems engineer. I did software <laughs> development, you know, in my first life. I was a bad programmer, I'll admit to that. <laughs> But I was pretty good at data modeling. So I, I kind of had this view that, well, I mean, when it comes to information, I mean, most people sort of you put information in front of people and they react to it, right? And they don't always think about the information they don't have. Well, I mean, so are you, are you providing the right information? Are you creating the right information for decision making that's going to create the behaviors that are appropriate and relevant and desired, right? And systems, if you're lucky, I mean, your systems will do that they will guide people they will point people in the right direction i think you know in today's world um there's too much data and not enough information right and i you know most of you right does that all, I, I i say that about core i've had a lot of corporate clients more i'm working nowadays more with these mission-driven organizations and their systems are very immature they're really challenged i mean even like the basic financial accounting reporting stuff is a real challenge right i don't know if you guys see that i mean, i i'm talking about organizations that maybe in the 2 to 5 or 10 million dollar range i mean very small like nonprofit type organizations that i've worked with lately big problem so you know the the the, the information system certainly another one um, yeah, which I think we would try to capture yeah. in our uh, organizational practices. So, you know, yeah, do you have exactly. the systems? Yeah. Do you have yeah. the, the pieces yeah. in play? If not, that's yeah. going to be a hole yeah. that you're going to have to, yeah. to plug. And unfortunately, so, a lot of changes from our experience mm -hmm. fail not because people weren't engaged, but we didn't give them the tools and the resources yeah. necessary to want yeah. to stay in line with it. So exactly. it is critical. Yeah. And yeah. we've seen that one too many times. So yeah. Yeah. again, you know, yeah. it's where does the organization um feel energy to go. We have mm -hmm. a, our hypothesis in the framework and what we're testing is that yeah. strategy and culture is the starting point because mm -hmm. if we don't yeah. have alignment around where we're going and how we're going, yeah. uh, the mistake we see in a lot of organizations is they mm -hmm. start with like, okay, let's just start mm -hmm. training people. And as long as we train them, you yeah. know, they're going to be good and everything's yeah. so that yeah. our, our yeah. hypothesis is that that is yeah. not the starting point at all. Mm -hmm. And then that when we're talking to organizations yeah. and we're using this lens of, of the OTA, we yeah. try to help them understand why that is probably mm. not the place to start. Yeah. You know? so. yeah. No, that, I, it makes a lot of sense. I, I, I certainly would agree with that. I think my, my five lever model is almost a layer. It's sort of the next layer down. Right. And the OTA model, I mean, it sort of fits into that. Right. So, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I it's see. that's, yeah. yeah, I strategy and culture, hard to argue with that. I think, yeah, the strategy as a starting point certainly is something that, um, right. You know, we're, Thank, we're at yeah. the first thing I look at. Thank um, you. I yeah. think Nidhi has her hand up. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Sorry to monopolize you guys. No, no, not at all. I was just listening. I um, I just had to add one thing. So basically, I think an organization, when they're uh, making any kind of a change, they need to identify what could be the low hanging fruits or what could be the immediate wins. So if they are able to show the results of those immediate wins to the organization, to the employees, employees feel uh, more motivated to work on the bigger goals then. So it has to start with smaller things, which are, you know, easily negotiable, which are easily, uh, you know, adaptable for the people. Uh, once you're able to achieve that, then you move to the next goal. So yeah. I think in that way, the execution is much simpler and you get more support from your people. Mm. 
Nitty, that's a really interesting point, and, and I'm going to add a layer to that. So, because you're right, traditionally, you know, we've said, what are the low hanging fruit? Where I'm going to challenge that is that, again, that's been imposed by someone who decided that something was a low hanging fruit. Let's shift the conversation and go ask people, what would be for you a low hanging or a quick win or something that would motivate you in this process. So, and I think that goes back to what Bianca had pulled us on earlier in, in the um, presentation around an internal versus external drivers of motivation, right? So typically our models of change have been what we call persuasive. So we want to externally motivate people by giving them, you know, fancy stories, or um, we try to persuade them by selling them. So, you know, if you look at even some of the models of change, on the market, they tell you is, you know, compelling vision of change, as long as we, you know, write it pretty, we sell it pretty, people will get motivated. So I agree with the low hanging fruit. The thing I would add is instead of us telling people or showing them is invite them to choose their low hanging fruit. So actually, right? this is yeah. the uh, actual case I want to study because, uh, you know, while I was working with General Motors and uh, what we did was, uh, you know, GM participated for the first time in workplace of choice survey. And uh, in that through that survey, of course, there are level of four or five dimensions that were identified on which, uh, you know, the organization need to improve their score. And what we did was we actually... Uh, you know, created kind of uh, focus group discussion environment okay. in gardens. Yeah. So we, we call them in gardens. We didn't do in office because we wanted the uh, atmosphere to be completely informal and employees to be completely open about their thoughts. And we created them awesome. into three themes and three different, different groups where they were discussing on the challenges. They only came with the challenges. They only came with the right behaviors. They told what are the low hanging fruits? What are the actions they want to take awesome. accountable for? And I think uh, that made a great impact because people also gain trust in the organization that yes, awesome. our voice is really heard. So I absolutely agree to what you say. Yeah, I love that. Thank you yeah. for sharing that story. That is really powerful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and I think that starting with small wins you know, is a good way of building confidence and self-efficacy and change, especially if you, if you feel that you don't have that skill level needed to master these more massive challenges say it's a good way of getting people into that feeling of confidence and when we feel confident we tend to be more autonomously motivated so just bringing it back to our motivation discussion earlier that can be a good way of tackling what seems like an overwhelming problem at the start to say and let's just, let's change what we can change first mm -hmm. what's easier or quicker to change oh we see that we have skills to to tackle change and to come out winning so we're going to continue on and I think confidence is a very important point. Just wanted to add one thing, sorry. Uh, the thing is that uh, in the organization, if the change is not communicated properly, or sometimes employee has a perception that, okay, this change is going to be major and we are not ready with in the terms of our skill set for this. So maybe we, you know, we'll uh, be somebody who will not be able to participate or we may be even terminated, you know, because people mm -hmm. have a lot of perceptions across change, right? Yeah. So now if you're able mm -hmm. to bring smaller changes, and give them the confidence that no, you can participate, you can very well take care of that. Uh, I think uh, they will be more, uh, you know, you can actually retain them in the process and you can get, uh, you know, more involvement as well. So, you know, what's interesting about what you're saying is it's making me think. So even when we talk about co-creation, you're right yeah. in the sense that as we go through even, let's say, the process of, you know, organizational transformation and alignment, it doesn't mean that people have to co-create in all of the pillars of the transformation, but maybe one yeah. where it feels more uh, important for them or they feel more drive, right? So someone might want to really have voice on vision or strategy or values but may not necessarily really want to care about working on the systems or do you know what I mean? So that's interesting because it also helps us to ask people, what is the thing that most motivates you, drives you and keeps you wanting to be involved? Because also not everyone will always want to be involved in everything. And I think we have to also be respectful that that's also a choice, right? People might say, you know what, I trust my colleagues or, oh, if I know so-and-so is doing this, I know they've got my back. So we don't want to also overimpose co-creation if people are not feeling the need for that. So that's a good point too, right? So where are people motivated to participate? 
And the first question that you're asking that, you know, what kind of challenges organization face with these models? I'll tell you what, on a basic root level, people feel that, oh my God, there's more work coming our way. You know? <laughs> That's very true. The ground, I'm telling you the ground reality. Okay. And yeah. people, people hate to go to meetings. Okay. Because there is this one working committee, then there is a second working committee. There is global working committee. Plus you also have to do your work. <laughs> right. So I think... That's why, again, we come to that same point, you know, the managers or the people who are, you know, taking accountability of the different work streams, they are, they are basically creating a bridge between the strategic and the operational goals, yes. right? So yes. there is some involvement definitely re- required from the employees. But yes, like you said, you know, what is that drives them to contribute? I think we should focus more on that area. If we can bring them to that level, I think they will be more and more involved themselves. Yeah. You are right. I I agree with that. That is a very good point. So I I recognize it's 1230 and in our time zone. And um, I do want to sort of wrap this up just so we can uh, allow you to continue with your days or evenings. Um, I'm I'm so appreciative. I I really am thankful for your time, uh, your input. Really, I I learned a lot myself. if you do want to connect, please connect. Like I say, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. I'm, I don't think I'm one of many <laughs> and uh, happy to have the connection. Um, any final comments or, or inputs before we log off for today? I just have one question. That's uh, David Day calling. <laughs> uh, David Day here. We're... Um, what happened to the talent within the organization in your example? Uh, are they still there in general? Have they moved around to different roles? Yeah. Have, um, uh, what's happened to them? Yeah. It's a, it's a good question, actually. So it's actually still evolving. Um, there are going to be new roles um, because the nature of the business will demand new roles. Um, and right. that is a piece of the conversation that is actually ongoing. Um, like I said yesterday in Obianca, my colleague Anne facilitated a conversation with the team around leadership profile. What's that going to look like in the future? Um, it was co-created for the most part with a good part of the management team, if not all. And um, now it's going to be a question of working with people to see what is, what is it they want to do, right? We want to give people agency here too, rather than just say, well, here we think you fit in this new role, is to have these conversations with people. And you know what's interesting is, and we've had this conversation with the director of, of uh, people and culture, is that, you know what, some people might just opt out. Um, some people might say this no longer fits for me, and I think that there's a reality to that. Uh, and that's okay, because sometimes the biggest honor we do to people is to um, let them go to somewhere where they are, will be more served or, or be better use of their strengths. So, Yes, um, and, su- and support them uh, in doing so. Exactly, exactly. So there's a whole, you're right, we're not fully at the end of that piece yet. It's It's a work in progress, but it's definitely in the process of thought around Yes, and being mindful that there's going to be shifts and people need to be engaged in that conversation around what these new roles will look like. And people will have an opt-in kind of perspective. What are the roles that they're interested or passionate about? And then, you know, the question um, she was asking the other day, we were talking about, she said, and then exactly to your point of how will we support, like, let's say someone needs certain development or training right so how is the organization going to get behind that and because it becomes tricky right if you need a role that's going to be filled right now and someone has a desire and wants to fit into that role but it might take them a year what do we do and how do we honor that in a way that allows a person to continue to grow while working towards something so These are all actually big questions. It's a good question you're posing and it's actually exactly what the organization's grappling with right now and trying to do it again in a human centric way so that it's not a decision made behind four four walls. Yes, Uh, do you know if they are 
assessing um, skills or are they assessing talents? Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in that and what happens uh, to people. Um, uh, the worst thing that could happen is for them to be laid off uh, in all yeah. likelihood. Um, yeah. uh, and is that being avoided? Um, I'm just wondering, we, we talk a great deal about hu humans and mm -hmm. sometimes we overlook our common humanity and um, which really is, uh, uh, you know, the key, I believe, to um, change right. and, uh, and change management itself. Well, um, we, yeah. We definitely the, uh, are not overlooking humanity, um, but I think it would be false to say that for sure there would not be anybody who I mean, I don't know if laid off. I think it. My my assumption is that what's going to happen is possibly some people will say, "I don't want to do any of these roles. These roles yes, don't I fit me, and that's okay too because people have choice and they have agency." So, um, yes. I think that will happen. I, I honestly would be, I think, Absolutely. lying to think that that's not going to occur. Um, it's the how. For me, more, it's how are we helping people transition? What support do we give them if they to choose to leave or if they don't have that place? Because the humanity part, you're right, that is definitely core in our process. It's not just the what, it's absolutely the how. Um, and as for how are we measuring, it's not just skill. We are looking at behavior. We're looking at um, skill. We're looking at attitude. So they you know, skill is something that can be trained in most people, right? Uh, unless we're talking, yeah. you're not going to be an engineer if you're not an engineer. But I mean, um, there's certain things that you could be taught. So you're right. It's, yes. it's multi-lensed. It's multi-lensed. Yeah. Yes, it's more about talent than skill. Yeah. Uh, move from role to role. Yeah, absolutely. I, um. Uh, thank you on your, your comment. The other question I had was how soon in the process was the CEO involved? Your client oh, pretty much from the beginning. Uh, is, mm -hmm. is the uh, human resources person. She doesn't like to be called that. <laughs> She's people and culture. <laughs> but yes, okay. Very good. I get, I well, get what I you're am, saying. I, I get I'm extremely happy about that. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, how soon did the CEO get involved? And were there questions to you about um, how, how, does, how does the, um, you know, you made a separation between people and and doing something for people profiting I think the term was and rather than focusing on the profit for the organization and I'm just wondering what the CEO's reaction would have been to that um, did you have conversations around that? Well, they're a purpose-driven organization, so that really wasn't a, an issue. Um, they were driven by a social mission to start off with, so um, that was never a barrier because it's the essence of who they are. The, the challenge was more as to how that social mission was maybe showing up even internally and how much voice people were being given within their own organization because they're very committed to you know fair pay to farmers very committed to a traceable supply chain but it's interesting how at one point it was also well what is 
fair pay, so to speak, or not fair pay, fair voice to people within your Oran organization. So she did have to confront her own beliefs. She had to confront her own issues around control. Uh, and she yeah. was involved quite up front because this couldn't have happened without her. Um, but she did yep. have to look in the mirror and, and ask some questions about why she believed some of the things she believed, because definitely they're socially driven. Their, their mission is set up like that. So um, the people profit purpose was never an issue around, you know, the fact that that's what they're there for. They are a very purpose driven organization. Yeah. It was more of a, how does that translate internally? How do we actually empower people within our own organization and not just our external customers and uh, suppliers? Yeah. Thank yes, you for that the, question. You're, you're welcome. Uh, the, I, I guess it, it sort of fits with, there's really only three things that um, really affect a person's role and power in an organization and, 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 and that is their, their own autonomy um, and the control that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. And then the access to resources right. within right. the context of their own role. Right. And if we think about uh, things that simply, uh, it I think we can um, uh, perhaps see more of the emotional side of it and uh, the um, the common humanity that is really there, the equality that is really there yeah. and um, the, the sharing of, of those things within each role. And we actually are shifting power or distributing Distribute. power. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that, that's the whole premise, yeah. Downward uh, to the people in the roles and there's something about um, <laughs> as you say um, people think that they're going to be potentially harmed and won't have a role left just because the power has shifted right and it yeah. Just get busier because the communication has to pick up, has the internal communication has to be constant. Right. So, um, if, yeah. And, and circular, more circular than it ever was. Yeah. Well, that's it. So, we're, we're trying to promote those, you know, ongoing, honest conversations. And unfortunately, it doesn't mean that it's going to be the perfect result, but at least it'll be an honest and more human way to, to have those communications, you know. So, at the end of the day, um, you know, no one's saying it'll be a perfect result, but at least if people feel that they have been treated with humanity and compassion and empathy, that is in my mind already a win. Um, I do apologize. We are going to have to wrap up because we do have another meeting at one and I uh, will need to prepare for that. And again, thank you all so much. I've been very appreciative of your time, your input, your comments. Um, we've taken many notes and it's going to help us to continue to evolve in our own uh, practice and hope to see some of you, whether it's on clubhouse connect on LinkedIn, and I'll see about uploading um, all of this to the uh, change management network platform. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. Great. Bye-bye. Take, Bye -bye. Care, Take care. Thanks.